Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today's a video I've been thinking about for some time and I finally put that, had that little bit of a push in order to sit down and put, if not pen to paper, then fingers to keyboard in terms of research. Now, as many of you know, I've got an 18 month old son slash ball of screaming rage. <laughs> And that's had a horrific impact on my ability to exercise, whether it's going running or cycling. Yes, I do try to use a running pram, but frankly, with my gangly frame, it's not particularly comfortable. And I've just found that I'm not doing as much as I should be. So with the view of trying to keep active within my day, I thought it would actually be interesting to look what the science is behind the 10,000 steps a day target. Now, this research wasn't just for my own personal interest. In the UK, obesity levels are on the rise. In 1993, 15% of the population was classified as obese. That number's now swollen to 29% of the population. That's according to data from 2022. Yes, I know it's three years old, but it's the latest government data as published in February for 2025. Always surprised me how slow things are to actually come up with official data. Now, I say this because this isn't just a personal interest video for me. At least 25% of my consultations as a GP, even when I'm not explicitly dealing with a weight related issue, can legitimately have outcomes that are improved by addressing a patient's potentially increased body weight. As a simple example, diabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea, joint pain, depression, heart disease, and interesting enough, osteoarthritis are all conditions where helping a patient attain a healthy weight may improve their symptoms in some way. So to that end, the concept of doing 10,000 steps a day is often recommended to patients looking to lose weight. Heck, it's a simple target and just about as easily suggested. Do 10,000 steps a day. Next patient, please. The problem is that where does this number come from? Where's the science? And although I recommend doing 10,000 steps a day is literally an advice line that's going to take you know, fewer than 10 seconds, actually doing those 10,000 steps a day is going to be somewhat time consuming for most patients. So is it the right recommendation given the investment they're going to have to make to it? So let's do a brief history lesson and turn the clocks back to 1964, specifically in Tokyo, Japan, October 1964, when you've got the Summer Olympics starting up. At the same time, to capitalise on the focus on activity and fitness that takes over a country when you've got an Olympiad rocking up there, there was a Japanese company, my apologies for pronunciation here, Yamasa Tokii. Keikiko, they created the first personal fitness pedometer called the Manpo Kai. Now the name there, Manpo Kai, derives from the Japanese words man, meaning 10,000, and po, meaning steps, with K system. Again, I can't apologize enough if I've gotten those pronunciations wrong. Now that's interesting enough, and it does seem to align nicely with the idea of an, an athletics fixture occurring and the want to try and challenge your countrymen to do more. And let's be clear, you know, the challenging nature of 10,000 steps is probably why it was chosen. But the reality behind choosing 10,000 steps doesn't seem to be quite so scientific. It's been suggested that the reason for selecting 10,000 steps is as much to do with the Japanese kanji because the symbol or number for 10,000 apparently looks like a man walking. I kid you not, an international health activity goal, one that takes some effort and time to achieve, might not be based on a particular health threshold, but rather just that it was a number that had a good resonance with Japanese culture. Now, before everybody looks at their Garmin, Fitbit, Apple Watch, etc., as though it'd been lying at them for years, that original 10,000 step target, whilst arbitrary, given its ubiquity, it's not surprising that subsequently there's been considerable research into it. <laughs> and astonishingly, it turns out it's not that far from the mark. 
Now, I say that the crucial tenet of modern medicine is acknowledging something is good for us, e.g. chewing willow bark reduces pain, but then determining why and how much is needed to get that benefit, i.e. willow bark is a painkiller because it turns out it contains aspirin. Now we find that 300 milligrams of aspirin can be used to treat a headache. So that's our scientific principle there. To that end, no one is questioning that the concept of being active is good for us. But research has been focused on where the sweet spot is, as in how much activity, how much time invested will generate diminishing returns. And astonishingly, it turns out that the original inventor of the Manpoke wasn't actually that far off the mark. The evidence is that the sweet spot might actually be approximately 7,500 steps. To that end, I've got a wonderful infographic that I keep on my computer and show to patients. Now, I don't have the origin of it. I've tried to actually find who I can attribute it to, but anything other than the daily infographic just leads to a dead link. And even the daily infographic is just a name I found. So keeping that in mind, I can't attribute it who it should belong to. The point is, from this infographic and reality, our world isn't designed to keep us healthy as humans now. A fundamental part of our world is the amount of time we spend sitting down. And given that most of us aren't able to radically change our work circumstances, actually opting for a standing desk might be a very reasonable way to improve our step count and our activities, if nothing else. Now, here's the question for you. Genuinely, I'd really be interested to know your answer to this. How would you feel if you went to the doctor and they had a standing desk? And they offered you the option, shall we keep standing or do you prefer us to sit down for the consultation? Please put your comments um, down below because I'd be really interested to see what the group mind thinks here. Because frankly, I'm wondering whether or not, as well as having a standing desk in my home office, if there might be utility to having one at work as well. If only just to show that I'm walking the walk, as it were, in terms of trying to be active. So with that in mind, let's actually look at some of the research into step counts. The first paper I've got is from JAMA, so the Journal of American Medical Association, in 2019. And they looked at the association with step volume and intensity with all-cause mortality in older women. Now, with that, they looked at nearly 17,000 women and they found that hazard ratios, i.e. the risk of something happening, progressively declined with increasing step counts before levelling off at around about 7,500 per day. Now, to reiterate, the risk of mortality dying in women of an average age of about 72 decreased with increasing step counts. To give you more data on that, the most significant hazard ratio decrease was 58% i.e. in the most active group, they found that it was a 58% reduction in risk of death compared to the most sedentary group. Now, that sounds very impressive, but that's statistics for you. Let's reframe that. If your risk of death is 0.2% per year and you drop it to 0.1% per year, that's still a 50% reduction in risk, so it isn't quite as impressive as things first sound. But Let's reframe it another way, taking information from the study. You say they followed up these patients over four and a half years. And over that time frame, 5.4% of those near 17,000 women died. The probability of being in the group that regrettably passed away was higher, the lower the activity level of those women was. Now, that's not to say that 10,000 steps isn't a valid target, but they were saying, 7,500 seemed to be the sweet spot, and after it, you had diminishing returns. So we're going to take that and run with it. There was a fascinating study in 2022, again from JAMA, but this time one of their subgroups, JAMA Neurology. Here they looked about 7,000 adults with the average age of 61 years and followed them over nearly seven years. In doing so, they found that 9,800 steps was associated crucial word there, with again a 50% reduction in the risk of developing dementia. Now, personally, my biggest health fear isn't actually dying. Don't get me wrong, I'm not exactly casually walking across the road with my eyes closed, but dying something will do. 
it doesn't seem to make so much sense to be quite as concerned about a guaranteed event. For me, my biggest fear is dementia, or at least a degenerative brain disease, given that my job can kind of be boiled down to being a brain on a stick. So it's not surprising that, you know, that level, that sort of concern is, you know, my area. So given the evidence there is quite strong that walking 9,800 steps a day on average could potentially halve my risk of dementia, even if that risk of dementia for me is 1%, sign me up for a standing desk and a pair of dancing shoes. I am going to really target that 10,000 steps a day. I might not get it, but I'm now, after having done this research, I'm really going to try and do it. So staying with the concept that 10,000 steps a day isn't the only show in town, a companion study, again in JAMA, but this time internal medicine, I, honestly, I'm surprised that all of my references do seem to come from one house of journals, but actually they're all different uh, divisions of the same journal. So anyway, that showed for every 2,000 steps a day you do, you could lower your risk of premature, crucial word, death by between 8 and 11%, whether or not we're looking at cardiovascular disease or cancers. Now, I'm going to step back from the pure numbers for a second and say we do need to be cautious about proclaiming that walking and shuffling about is going to prevent all ills. After all, there is the typically cautious and specific language in these papers, i.e. risk of premature death, and that the studies have found associations. Very importantly, they're not demonstrating causality here. Now, I realise I've used this example before in other videos, but there is an association between the reduction of births in Belgium and the number of storks nesting in Belgium. But I think we can all reasonably assume that the decline in Belgian birth rate isn't due to the reduced number of storks not being able to deliver as many babies before. So we do need to have a modicum of caution against all of this data where we're talking about associations. However, Personally, I'd be inclined to take a pill that gave the same promise that these exercise studies are suggesting, particularly given we know the side effects of exercise. If I'm going to stretch that analogy a little bit further though, what if it's not actually the pill of exercise? What if there was an inhaler of exercise that had the same benefits? What I'm alluding to here is there's a suggestion that the number of steps isn't actually the key factor here but it's just an easy metric to measure. What if the being active compound, that being was the key here? What if that duration of activity was the thing that was giving the benefit? So let's reframe our 10,000 steps for a moment because that's actually a considerable distance for the average person. It's about eight kilometers. And in terms of active minutes, that's gonna set you back between 90 and 150 minutes per day based upon the average walking speed of three to five kilometers an hour of an adult. Now, here's where I find things become problematic when we move away from that 10,000 step target to other forms of health advice. Bear in mind to say do 10,000 steps is easy. When we look at other things, the recommendations become less clear cut for the patient. Now, the NHS recommends aiming for 150 minutes of moderate activity in a week or 75 minutes of vigorous activity. Well, if we're getting 10,000 steps a day, taking a conservative estimate that's going to take us 90 minutes, we're already smashing that moderate activity level for the week. Kind of. The thing is, moderate activity is considered to be where you've got an exercise level that you can talk at, but not sing. Yeah, I'm not a great fan of that, particularly someone who doesn't sing, but perhaps a better metric is walking briskly so that your heart rate rises. Okay, makes sense. But how much heart rate are we talking about? Oh, I can give you the answer for that. It's between an increase by 50 to 70% of your maximum theoretical heart rate. And this is where things start to get less simple. Now, there is a simple calculation to determine your maximum heart rate, and that's done taking your age, multiply it by 0.7, and then subtract from 208. 
after reaching for my calculator, my theoretical maximum heart rate is now 179 beats a minute, which, if I'm honest, feels about right these days. So moderate exercise, we're aiming for a heart rate between 50 and 70% of your maximum. So we'll call that about 90 beats a minute for me. Which actually is probably, get, um, probably what I get when I'm walking anyway. Certainly if I look at the recorded walks I've put on my Garmin, you, know, you can see on a normal pace, I'm getting a heart rate about 95 beats a minute. So it does kind of align. Although I do walk relatively briskly anyway, much to my wife's irritation. I've got long legs. Now, heck, this is beginning to feel a bit circular though, and this is why I wanted to do the video. Before doing the research for this, I was aware that the 10,000 step goal was just a marketing gimmick, and my plan had actually been to create a video to share with patients when I was trying to get them to improve their activity levels. I'd say there's not much evidence to support 10,000 steps a day, but the NHS will advise you to 150 minutes across the week. So it turns out that whilst that 10,000 steps was just a random number, by chance it did land close to the physiological benefit for humans. Even if 10,000 steps a day is too much of a stretch, there's still evidence that 2,000 steps a day is still helping. Conversely, active minutes are a better metric of your active levels, given your heart rate's now taken into the equation, but that's a pain in the neck to calculate and then monitor if you're frankly not already an owner of a sports watch and not already interested in monitoring your numbers. The thing is, the core tenet of helping a patient is that an intervention, for it to be effective, there's got to be a low barrier for entry. And we see this, as mentioned earlier, about inhalers. If you give the patient the wrong type of inhaler, so for example, one that they have to suck rather than one they can just breathe with, it doesn't matter how amazing the drug is, that patient still probably won't use that inhaler as they should do because it's not easy for them. The same is true here. Activity minutes are better, but they're a pain in the neck. So although the 10,000 steps was a random dart thrown at a board, it seems they managed to hit the bullseye. So I'm actually not going to change my practice. I'm going to keep recommending patients aim for 10,000 steps a day initially. If they feel like increasing the difficulty level, we can look at intensity uh, minutes as well. So it's all about helping the patient and identifying what works for them. So with that in mind, staying with what helps and what works for patients, I'd be really interested to know what your thought would be if you came into my consultation room and found me using a standing desk. Is it something you'd be pro or something you'd be anti? Please put it in the comments down below because I'm genuinely interested. So I do hope this has been a useful video for you. If you'd like to see me do more videos that are specifically patient focused, where I'm trying to break down some of the advice we normally give or try to help somebody get to grips with that advice, particularly while talking about the evidence base for it, please put in the comments down below what other videos you'd like me to uh, tackle. With that in mind, I'll say thanks for watching this far. Cheerio, and I'll see you in the next one.